On this edition of Around BCC, Bristol Community College celebrates African American History Month. A new slate of student senators take the helm. And our alumni profile looks at a woman who used her BCC education to get back here. Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Thibault. We're smack dab in the middle of the 2009 spring semester with warmer weather thankfully on the way. Leading off this month, Bristol Community College has a tradition of celebrating diversity, no more so than during African American History Month each February. Once again, BCC developed a full slate of programs celebrating African American history. It all started with what has become a traditional celebratory march around the Fall River campus led by an African drummer. The month's programs allowed for a combination of celebration and introspection. One of the highlights was a campus-wide commemoration of the historic election of President Barack Obama. Included in the festivities was Congressman James McGovern, who made it clear that President Obama's rise to office was special on many levels. This is a unique moment in history because the first African American is being sworn in as the President of the United States, which tells me that our nation has matured, that our nation has, has grown up, um, has, and, and that the, the, the cause of civil rights um, is actually prevailing. Now, that doesn't mean that discrimination has ended and that we still have a lot to, uh, to deal with, but we have come a long way. Uh, in my lifetime, and in your lifetime as well. And I couldn't help but appreciate the power of this moment. And, um, and I'll tell you, I, um, you know, the, the, the one thing that has happened here is that it will no longer be uh, unusual or unique for an African-American man or woman to be a candidate for the highest office in this country. The month also featured displays of black inventors and a celebration of African-American literature for both adults and children. Other programs focused on history. James DeWolf Perry is a descendant of a Rhode Island family which was influential in the slave trade of early America. In discussing his role in the PBS documentary Traces of the Trade, Perry says the events of his ancestors opened up his eyes about racism. Ten of us, um, I think, took away two basic lessons from this. Uh, one was about how white people look at race today and the full extent of the range of how white people look at race. The other is about the history and some of the surprising aspects of this history. Um, in terms of the the range of white experience around race, I don't think any of us in the film expected when we started the kind of differences that we would see even among us. And because this is a group of people who agreed to go on this trip, you don't see the majority of Americans who tend to look at race, uh, if they're white for example, they tend most often to look at race as something that doesn't concern them or that's an issue of the past or that's an issue for people who are black or of other races but not for people who are white. The issue of racism on the BCC campus was the focus of a workshop attended by college students and staff. BCC student and Wige Moniz led off the discussion by saying she feels there's still a distinction being made by people in this region when it comes to the acceptance of African Americans. I hear many people say that the race card is thrown out there way too often and although I agree that we come a long way since slavery, I'm here today to prove that racial discrimination is still a big issue. Um, there's a saying that goes, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Well, in my case, and with many people of African descent, you don't even get a chance to begin with. Because all that most people see, first and foremost, is the color of your skin. I know from personal experience how uneasy and sometimes unfair it is to grow through life as an African American. Prejudice is everywhere, from something simple as shopping in grocery stores or applying for a job, to important life steps such as looking for an apartment or buying a car. 
I soon find out that we're not all created equal. Student trustee Gloria Sadler says the problem of acceptance can be traced to an implied disconnect between minority students and BCC staff. Yesterday as I was leaving, a student approached me and the student said to me, you know what, there's a lot of bias against minorities here on campus. I won't be back next semester in the fall. I says, well, why is that? She says, because I just really feel depressed having to go through being a black Hispanic and I can sense, she said she felt the bias against her. I said, well, don't do that. Don't leave. Just, you, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll overcome this. Look how I've overcome it. And she says, no, I need to go to a college where they're going to be more of my kind and I don't have to feel as if I've been singled out because of my skin color. This is something students of minority status often say to me. Again, they're not going to say it to you faculty and staff, especially if they haven't made that connection. But for some reason, I am a people person. I, I don't care what color, what the nationality, I am a people person. And if I have people of other cultures who are not black approach me with these complaints, clearly there's an issue that needs to be addressed here with regards to racism. Another highlight was a talk by Dr. David Kirkland, a professor of English education from New York University, who spoke on the significance of hip-hop language. Growing up in a downtrodden section of Detroit, Dr. Kirkland saw the connection of hip-hop language with the stories of the inner city poor. Hip-hop gave me imagination, all right. Hip-hop also gave me words to spell my name. Hip-hop gave me rhythm to breathe, a way to think, a way to live, most importantly, a way to remember. I learned through hip-hop that the qualities that were in me were not only real, they were inescapably true. It was the scalpel for repairing what I'm considering a lost life. A lot of people think that when I talk about hip hop in this way, I'm overly romanticizing it, right? I'm celebrating hip hop, making it, making it into something more than what it is. But I've learned like others in my generation have, has learned that without hip hop, without the force behind hip hop, and sometimes as rude and eloquent quint raps, we have no words to tell our stories. The month culminated with another celebratory event, the marking of the 100th anniversary of the formation of the NAACP and its national and regional impact. The discussion of racial and cultural diversity, although in the spotlight during African American History Month, has been and will continue to be a BCC priority. We'll have more around BCC right after this short break. Students play a big role in the governance here at Bristol Community College, primarily through the Student Senate. We've done a number of pieces on the Senate in the past, and it's good to meet some of the new senators each year, and we're going to spend a few moments with two senators. They're actually both officers of the Student Senate this year. To my left is Tia Castellanos and Fabian Andre, two of the senators this year. Thank you for, for joining me today. Well, thank you for having us. Now, Tia, you're the president of the Senate this year, is that correct? Yes. Um, both of you are first year senators, your first year as, as senators? Yes. Now, yes. Fabian, you are vice president? Oh, no, I'm just a regular member. Oh, I'm sorry, I called you an officer. I, I, I just boosted your rank <laughs> without even you knowing it. I apologize for that. Tia, let me start with you, uh, and I'll ask both of, both of you this question. What interested you about being a senator? Uh, being able to speak for all of the students here at BCC, I play a big part, and I hope I play a big part in you know bringing that communication between the faculty, staff, and to the students, and helping them be able to come out and speak to the faculty and staff. Because a lot of times they 
just don't feel like they belong or mm -hmm. something. So it's just that connection, being able to connect the students to the faculty and staff here because they're wonderful and, you know, I want them to be able to experience everything that BCC has to, to offer. Fabian, how about you? What interested you about being a senator? Well, um, the motive is because like, you're going to be able to represent the students and have any concerns. If they have any concerns, and let you know, so you're going to be able to help them. So, uh, as she mentioned, sometimes the students are more comfortable st speaking and telling the issues to those that are equal, equal mm -hmm. than just to faculties because sometimes they think that the facts are not open, they don't have time. So it's more easier for them to come and talk to us and try to resolve them problems than they just go and talk with the faculties. Now, uh, either one of you can answer the, the, these questions. Um, the, the Senate is that, again, that liaison between the student body and the administration. Uh, there's also um, a student who sits on the Board of Trustees as well, uh, which is the governing body of, of, of the college. How difficult is it? to get students input or is it easier because you're students to talk to other students to get input um, on, on how things could change or be better here at BCC or is it always a struggle trying to get that that input from students on how to make things better? Tia? Um, I think it's easier for us as students because we do you know go into classes with these the other students of the college and we mingle and so I think it's easy it's easier for them to speak to us about what concerns they have and even what they are pleased with the college because they we, you know we always like to bring that to the table as well as any concerns that they have so I think it's much easier for them to speak to a student as opposed to the staff because again they may just fear that oh they don't have time or nor they don't have an open door policy or maybe I need to make an appointment when they need some someone to talk to right now. Mm -hmm. Now, is there representation on the Senate from the New Bedford campus and Attleboro campuses? Is yes, there, is there we have uh, Dave Correa. He is our New Bedford rep, okay. and Tony Zangami is our Attleboro rep. So they primarily take most of their courses at those locations. Yes. And they're sort of the ear, if you will, for students at those locations. Because that's important because as BCC grows, there's needs in, in those areas as well for students, students to be heard. Let, let me ask you, um, the Student Senate is involved with um, the clubs on campus, um, overseeing the clubs, uh, providing a little bit of funding for the clubs. Um, how does that work and, and how, how is the club structure this year? Is it, how many clubs are there, if, if you know, and, and how is it this, this year in terms of the clubs? I'm not sure exactly how many clubs there are right. this year. I know that the list has compressed dramatically since the uh, fall of last year. So there's not many clubs um, remaining. They have turned in, we uh, approved the paperwork that is turned in. There is a, a process that students can pick up um, packets from Student Life and it goes through how to start up a club. You need um, officers and advisor mm -hmm. and everything is in there that they can start up a club. So um, the club, uh, we do approve the club's um, funding. Their funding this year is, I think, $175 is what the clubs get when they are approved. That's their nest egg to start up and mm -hmm. do whatever um, they need to do for the club. We um, like to see that the clubs are fundraising. And uh, we've seen a lot of clubs. They are so awesome. V fundraising all throughout the Christmas season, the Thanksgiving season, and a lot of clubs have given and donated. Um, we are looking forward this spring for budget requests. Mm -hmm. Clubs needing extra monies to um, go on trips or fund different activities that they would like to do um, to supplement the monies that they have raised with their clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, what about getting back to the, to the governance and, and working with students and, and, and um, interacting with the administration? Um, is there a process for you to, to talk with administrators here? Can you just pick up the phone and make an appointment with the president or anyone else if there's an issue that needs to be addressed by the Senate? Um, well, actually, President Sprague is frequenting our meeting. Um, so he has came... So you don't I, need to go to him. He comes to you, no, right? Really. <laughs> and he, uh, they, everyone is readily available. Um, and President Sprague does have open office hours that he does see students. So we can go in at those times. But again, he does come to our meeting. So any questions that we have, any concerns that we need to bring, we can usually bring them to him when he is at our meeting or 
we can again know where he is. Mm -hmm. um, Steve um, also comes to our Steve meetings as well. Right. So they're readily available and they're, they, they're eagerly wanting to know what students' concerns are. Now, the, the Senate is also involved in some, if you will, lighthearted activities throughout the year. Um, talk about some of those. Obviously, there's something normally around the end of each semester that the, that the Senate gets involved in. What are some of the things that the Senate does that's really fun for students? Um, just recently, we had the tree decorating contest that is a subcommittee off of the Senate. It's the Activities Committee. Mm -hmm. And that went over pretty well. We had Club Theater was the big winner with mm -hmm. their awesome upside down tree and all. Everything that, you know, Club Theater represented was on their tree. And that went well. Everyone loved it. We had the public come in and, you know, just the, it was not a Christmas tree. It was a tree decorating contest. Right. So we had uh, the dental club come in and, mm -hmm. you know, do little hands and their names. Everyone did, a, a, did something for their club. So it was wonderful. We're planning now in the process of planning for the end of the year bash. So we're looking forward to doing that. And again celebrating the end of the year <laughs> and it seems like time goes by so fast that um, you know you're planning for it and all of a sudden it's here and then then you go forward I want to talk briefly about the fact that um, how difficult it is to keep continuity on the Senate we talked about this before we started here mm -hmm. today that both of you are first-year students uh, you're a first-year student I'm sorry Fabian it's the last year so you'll be yeah. leaving um, there's a big turnover in the Senate, and how does that impact how things get done within the Senate? Maybe, Fabian, how do you see that as, a, as an issue? Well, um, as she mentioned before, we don't, we have like this uh, interview committee mm -hmm. that we're going to interview new members. So I know that I'm leaving. So as soon as I leave, uh, there's going to, like, if I'm not wrong, maybe two, in two weeks or in a week, we're going to start the um, interview committee, interview new members, mm -hmm. and get like, if they are approved, they're gonna be in the Senate and try to run it if the other member's not gonna be able to stay it. As, like me, because I'm gonna be graduating, I'm not gonna be here. Mm -hmm. Now, can any student be a senator? Do you have to be a full-time student? There is currently, you have to be taking um, six credits, I believe is, that it is the information that went out. Um, and anyone who is interested in being in the Senate, I mean, it's a, it's a way to get your feet wet. It's a way to get some experience because, mm -hmm. again, I did not come in with the Senate having any of this previous experience. Right. I'm learning as I go along, but it's the follow-up, the follow-through, and it's definitely, you know, the experience building on upon everything that you learn. Mm. Well, Tia and Fabian, I want to thank you for joining us today, and good luck for the rest of the, uh, the academic year. I really appreciate it. Well, thank, you thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you for having us again. Yes. <laughs> Coming up next on Around BCC, it's our Alumni in Your Community segment. And this month, we interview a woman who used her BCC education as a springboard to come back to the college, and she now serves as an administrator. Hi, I'm Tara Romanovich, class of 1971. I had a wonderful experience at BCC. I was pretty involved. I was on the Student Senate. I was very involved because I was a work-study student, so I was working in the office and, as I said, helping to kind of build the campus. It was pretty new, and we knew the faculty on a very personal basis because a lot of them were involved in either the Student Senate or some of the clubs. I worked in student activities, so I was involved in a lot of the activities and met a lot of the staff, and I can't say anything but praise for all of the people who really took the time out to really guide me and guide a lot of people who were really unsure of who they wanted to be when they grew up. And it was kind of a nurturing environment, but it was also a very empowering environment because it was a place where people allowed you to help them define what they were doing. So I think it was a really interesting time to be part of BCC because they were sort of defining who they were as a college. and. As a student, I was able to help do that. My major at Bristol Community College was child care, and at the time I wasn't sure if I wanted to go on, but because I enjoyed working with that in that field so much and the faculty members who worked with me were so encouraging in terms of going on, and special education was just starting to find its own, which was the area that I was interested in. So I was very much encouraged by faculty and staff to continue my education right away, which I did. I left Bristol Community College and went to UMass Amherst where I got a degree 
in um, elementary education and special and a focus on special education. And I was probably one of the pioneers who graduated from the child care program, which was actually designed as a career program, and had the chance to take all those credits with me. So I really had to work both on the university level and with the college here to sort of assure that the courses that I had taken were actually of the same value and level that they were taking courses at UMass. So I actually didn't lose any credits, which was really admirable for me and for BCC to have, you know, created that kind of a pathway even back then for career programs. After I graduated from the University of Massachusetts, I got a job in the Fall River School Department and worked there for three years teaching special ed and then um, came actually back to Bristol Community College as an employee and started working here under some grants that were working with uh, teaching reading to special needs things. Uh, individuals and then I felt the need to actually go back and get my master's so I decided to go back to Bridgewater State College and get um, a master's in administration. I went back to school and got an advanced degree from Harvard um, University and decided to really pursue changing careers into management and doing more um, of the administrative level and while I was doing that I was actually hired to work as the Director of Academic Advisement at Bristol Community College and I worked there for about five years and then moved over to financial aid and did the Director of Financial Aid for about five, six years there and then um, left financial aid because I had the opportunity to work at the state office with all 15 community colleges. So I left and worked at the state college for um, the state executive office of community colleges where I did capacity building for all 15 community colleges and it was really an exciting job. It was an opportunity to really see what different community colleges were doing, not just Bristol, and also to build capacity because I just feel like community colleges are so underutilized and we're so busy doing that we forget to brag about what we do and we forget to grow to the level that we really have the ability to do sometimes because we're such worker bees. And um, working on the state level gave me the opportunity to really work with other state agencies like the Department of Transitional Assistance, the Department of Apprenticeship Training, Department of Labor, um, and doing some statewide building of different programs so that there were system approaches to issues. I had been working at the state level for about seven years and um, had always had, my heart has always been at Bristol Community College and they were opening up the New Bedford campus and a couple of people called me and asked me if I might be interested in throwing an application in and I thought very long and hard about it because I really did enjoy my job at the state level in that kind of capacity building but BCC being near and dear to my heart, I decided to apply and was uh, given this position and came back in September of 2001 to open up this campus. Operating the campus has been such a joy and a lot of pain. It's been um, growing pains as with everything else. We started out with about 400 students and we now have 1,600 students and we have brought in uh, millions of dollars worth of grant as well. And so it's really been a phenomenal opportunity to be invested in a community like New Bedford that never really had a higher education commitment to it and to be able to work with employers and community agencies to sort of say, wow, we, we Bristol Community College, can really make a difference in their lives. So I've been really involved in the downtown New Bedford uh, Board of Directors. I've been involved with the WIB, with the Chamber of Commerce, and a lot of other workforce and efforts to sort of see where BCC can grow and the impact it can have. I met my husband, Bob Karen, who also teaches and works at Bristol Community College and has spent uh, the majority of his career here um, at a BCC event years and years ago and um, that's been a great relationship. We spent a long time just sort of living and enjoying our lives and then um, decided before it was too late <laughs> to have a child and I have a beautiful daughter, Michaela, who is a senior at Stang now and has just um, been the joy of our lives. It's one of those things that you sort of think you can live without and then mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's made a world of difference in who we are. I owe a lot to that, to BCC for having opened my eyes up to a world beyond my little world. And um, I think also the confidence that it gave me to be able to think about myself as someone who could 
move forward. And as an employee, I think it's really been staggering to see the impact that I've had on others' lives and the impact that that has had on the community. And uh, every day I hear students come in here and say thank you to either myself or my staff uh, for making their life a better place. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I think it just feels really good to be able to give back to a place that really helped your life start on its road and its journey. So it's been a powerful journey for me, both from a student perspective and from an employee. Here are some other news and notes now from around BCC. With all the obstacles facing BCC during these challenging economic times, it was welcome that members of the campus community had the opportunity to meet with State Education Secretary Paul Revel. The two-hour meeting was part of Revel's intent to meet with all state public and community colleges. It's a very important uh, uh, visit because it gets me uh, down at the grassroots level, able to have a conversation with the leadership of the college, with faculty at the college, with people on the staff, and uh, most important, with students. Uh, and I'm asking them how they perceive their institution, what makes it distinctive and what makes it special, what are the particular challenges that face that uh, their institution and this college, um, where do they see the future taking us collectively? What role the college ought to play in the future? And in particular, what would be their advice to me? What would be their advice to the governor, to the legislature by extension, about what we ought to be emphasizing in terms of education policy and the kind of support we give to their community college and to colleges and universities all across the Commonwealth? Revel also made it clear that he and Governor Patrick value the importance of a community college education. And that constrains us, frankly, in what we want to do, because part of our argument is that we need a, a bigger, bolder, broader, deeper education system to prepare children to be successful in the 21st century. And uh, that will have costs associated with it. And uh, rather than having additional revenues that we can dedicate to that, in fact, we have less in the way of revenue than we've had in the past, so we're having to strategically cut. So it's, uh, it's challenging. It doesn't mean that change stops. And it doesn't mean that, uh, well, let's put it this way, it does mean that having a vision about a system of uh, 21st century education that prepares all our kids to be successful is more important than it ever was before. Bristol Community College and the Azores have finalized an agreement which will allow for information to be shared between the college and Azorian libraries. In making the announcement, State Representative Michael Rodericks said the agreement will allow BCC students access to exclusive resources. A portal that would allow access to secure documents within their library. It would almost be as though they would have a branch of their library here uh, in Fall River at Bristol Community College. So any students, uh, any adults, anyone interested in doing research on their family's history, uh, on, on the immigration of, of their family, on what town or village they're from, what's happening now contemporary, what's going on today in Ponte Delgada, you know, what music are they listening to, what books are they reading, what plays and what movies are they interested in, we'll have access to that information. The inaugural season of men's and women's basketball is now complete. Congratulations to men's head coach Rob Delalu and women's head coach Sheila Freitas for guiding the bees to a respectable first foray into intercollegiate play. That's all for Around BCC this month. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching.